Welcome to the Lord's Day service for uh, January 7th, 2024, a new year. I'll start by reading some scripture. And our first reading is from Acts, Acts 18. Hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. After staying for a considerable time, Paul said farewell to brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, and he was accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. At Concrea, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow, and when they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but first he himself went into the synagogue and had a discussion with the Jews there. When they asked him to stay a little longer, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And then he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed in Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and he greeted the church and he went down to Antioch. And after spending some time there, he departed from that place through the region of uh, Galatia, Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, there came, then he came to Ephesus, and in Ephesus there was a Jew named, to, named Apollos, and he was from Alexandria. And he was an eloquent man, and he was well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, but he only knew the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when a Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wished to cross over to Acacia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote, and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. On his arrival, he greatly helped those through grace that, he, that had become believers, of those who became believers, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing them by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. And then our second reading continues this, and this is where uh, um, in chapter 19 of, of Acts, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. When now, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples, and he said to them, Do you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they replied, No, we have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, They answered, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized in the spirit of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, they were, there were about 12 of them. And then our gospel reading is Mark, uh, Mark chapter 1. Hear what the Spirit saying to the church. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the people from the whole Judean countryside and the people of Jerusalem were coming out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed in camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey, and he proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, and I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and, uh, and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now imagine that you're walking through a crowd. Something doesn't seem quite right. You, come to the, you came to this concert to have a good time, and you are in the lobby, and you're looking for the restroom. It's intermission. And then you see a man collapse in front of you. 
several people notice and they're gathering around and they're trying to revive him, but something is wrong. He's unconscious. And you yell out, is there a doctor in the house? Within a few seconds, someone pushes through the crowd and kneels next to the patient, looking exactly the part. And like they know exactly what they're doing. And you say, are you a doctor? And he says, well, no, uh, but I did stay in a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> now, of course, this is crazy. Is, look, is looking the part good enough to get the job done? If you eat your Wheaties every morning, are you going to win, uh, win the sprint race? Are you going to automatically become a world-class pole vaulter? <laughs> of course not. But something is in us wishes that we could. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the premise of so many commercials. Now, of course, these are just plain silly examples. But have you ever exper experienced your imposter syndrome in yourself? Perhaps you've just been given a new job, a big job, or maybe you are in a prestigious college, or you've, you've just, you're just given the performance of your life. You know, you think, well, why do they want to hear me? What, what is it about me? Well, we all have this kind of imposter syndrome, but the difference between a real imposter, like the Holiday Inn guy, and feeling like a imposter is whether you have the preparation and training to take over. You are able to do these things reflexively when you are prepared for real. Now imagine the apostles. There is a scene in The Chosen, the series that's on uh, um, Amazon Prime, I think, that uh, when that's about Jesus and the disciples. Now when the Jesus are sent out two by two by Jesus to go spread the gospel and perform miracles, and the disciples, they react very differently to this. Uh, some have varying degrees of fear which is natural when you think about it. Now, some are just ready to go, and they have, they're filled with confidence. Others, like Peter, were worried about leaving his spouse behind. And most of them were just very uncertain. There's a strong sense of imposter syndrome in them. That, you know, they're well-trained, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, it, but... It, but they still feel that way. And the program, The Chosen, does a good job of showing the complexity of their emotions and their responses. This week, we encounter several very interesting characters in the book of Acts in a similar way. Each person has different expertise, different abilities, and influences. We know the narrative in Acts is abbreviated, in other words, they're, obviously the stories were much longer in real life, but the, but the characters are still very complicated, and we're given um, a lot to work with. Now, Apollos is a central character in all of this, in spreading the gospel story. And he was in Ephesus and in Corinth, and these are two major centers of Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. And he's mentioned not only in Acts, but also several times in the letters to the Corinthians and to in the letter of Titus. Martin Luther even thought that Apollos was the author of the anonymous letter to the Hebrews. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, Apollos is described as a well-educated Jewish man from uh, Alexandria. And he knew scripture well, and apparently he was really charismatic. But he needed further instruction, since he only knew about the baptism from John, it says. And this is very curious. What does it mean that he didn't need more instruction? Uh, was the baptism of John proclaimed, that, he, that John proclaimed, was it insufficient? Um, now, Apollos spoke with confidence, and he was stirred by the Spirit, and he didn't seem to feel like an imposter, at least very much. So, we wonder about this. 
Now, Priscilla and Aquila would pull him aside after they heard him, and they pulled him aside for some further teaching and further learning. Well, a lot, what, what is it that alarmed them about what Apollos was teaching? Now, we get two clues from Scripture. First comes from the next chapter, in chapter 9, which I read second, when traveling around Ephesus, Paul, presumably somewhat later, pointedly asks around and said, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they didn't know what he was talking about. They only knew the baptism of John, kind of like Apollos. This must have been something that Apollos was teaching them. The other clue comes in 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6, when Paul heard people saying, I belong to Paul and I belong to pa Apollos. Divisions and loyalty, instead of thinking about uh, belonging to Jesus, they were uh, dividing and divisions and loyalties were already cropping up in these uh, early churches. And it was from the very beginning of Paul's ministry that this was being seen. It must have been a big problem for it to show up in Acts and then to have Paul mention it in his letters as well. It looks like the teaching of the various churches was drifting away from being Christ-centered. Instead, it was becoming leader-centered. Now, while Apollos was filled with the Holy Spirit, that apparently wasn't enough. He didn't have the expertise needed to overcome the divisions and to offer God's way more accurately, as it says. Somewhere along the way, Paul, Apollos either didn't receive the word in the, or in the way that he should have, or he received some bad teaching. We can't be sure. We don't really know. But as we can see throughout Paul's ministry, Paul was struggling to get the churches to focus on Jesus and not on their tribal loyalties. In our Mark reading, John the baptizer is clearly pointing to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of Jesus was, was not his baptism or the baptism of John at all. It was the union of God the Father and the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus. The baptism should be beyond all divisions and all differences of opinion. Isn't that ironic? Because baptism has been a major point of division in the church through the centuries. How did we get it so wrong? I don't know. We don't really know whether Mark was written before um, the Count in Acts or or before or after Paul's letters. We're not sure about when that timing was. But the story of John baptizing Jesus makes it crystal clear that this is about the Holy Spirit, not about Paul or Apollos or any other person. And there are a couple of uh, other overlooked parts in that story that should impact about how what we think about baptism and about what it was thought about then and what we should do about it today. First, Ephesus was a major center of the church. And second, Priscilla and Aquila are the people Paul entrusts to educate Apollos. So take a look at the map in your bulletin. Ephesus is the capital of the province of Acts of Asia. And it had over 250,000 people in it. And it was the gateway to the rest of Asia Minor in, today, in what we call Turkey today, modern-day Turkey. And like the rest of the Aegean Sea area, it was very cosmopolitan and very influential. It was also the center of the cult of Artemis, which is also another story that we have in Acts who was the goddess of hunting and chastity and childbirth. Now, she was, a very, she was a very positive female figure in ancient Rome, in ancient Roman times. And she brought great comfort to the people, the, this goddess of, of uh, um, Artemis. 
in the hyper-masculine Roman world around them, Artemis was like a fresh a breath of fresh air. Everything we read about in Paul's letter to the Ephesians and Paul's letter to in 1st and 2nd Timothy has to do with the overwhelming influence and background of Artemis. The second thing that we have to learn from this is that it's significant that Priscilla is mentioned before her husband Aquila. And she is also the most frequently mentioned woman minister in Paul's writings. Bringing Apollos into the fold and correcting his teaching was obviously a crucial task. Paul trusted Priscilla, especially. And just like he trusted Phoebe to deliver, deliver the letter to the Romans, in, in uh, his letter to the Romans, Paul put some of the most important missions, some of the most important work that he had to do in the hands of women. This is why I think it's likely, as I mentioned, we talked a little bit before, um, I think it's likely that Priscilla was the author of Hebrews instead of Apollos that Martin Luther taught, thought. It's because Priscilla had credentials from Paul. Apollos didn't. Paul, Paul was, at, you know, what you hear in the context here is that Paul was worried about Apollos and worried about the teaching that Apollos was, Apollos was providing. He respected Apollos, but he needed further instruction. So in case anybody misinterprets Paul's opposition to the cult of Artemis and about his uh, proclaiming the superiority of Jesus, if anybody proclaims us as being against women in any way, as many people do about the book of Ephesians and 1 Timothy especially, all you have to do is look at Priscilla and the trust that Paul put into Priscilla. So if it's clear then, that churches should be Christ-centered, if it's clear that women were crucial to Paul's ministry, if it's clear that expertise matters in preaching the word, then why does it seem that these things are so opposed in the institutional church? Rather than being Christ-centered, churches seem to be more interested in culture wars and politics. Instead of elevating the teaching of women, so many churches still cling to patriarchy and push women down, as if it's mandated by Scripture. Instead of relying on biblical expertise in the witness of the Holy Spirit, many churches push away biblical studies and modern learning in favor of old-fashioned, what we call clean and, uh, or plain and clear preaching which is really just a cover for American fundamentalism. I spoke with uh, Heidi Greider, Reverend Heidi Greider, who some of you know, and she told me something very interesting recently. She was the director of chaplaincy at Seattle Christians Hos or Children's Hospital for many years. And, um, and many of you have seen her preach at Edmonds. Now, she left that job uh, a little while ago, and that was a management job. She was that, the head of the staff there, and um, she now uh, has taken a new job as an on-call chaplain for Swedish hospitals. And she's really enjoying working directly with patients again. It's such holy work. It's such important work. But she told me that after uh, being away from uh, that direct work, patient care for so long, she felt like a rookie again. And she had to relearn her job. She felt like she had to do that. But then she found that her expertise in ministry that she had wasn't that far away and that she was able to rely on those resources. And she realized how vital and holy that work that she was doing was. So she was able to tap into that earlier learning. Many people don't understand why chaplains especially, and ministers, some people even, are so highly educated 
or why they should be educated as much as they are. I mean, isn't it just listening? Isn't it just kind of like, you know, preaching the word directly? Isn't it just being kind and compassionate? Isn't it, is being filled with the Holy Spirit enough? No, because expertise really does matter. Education and clinical experience, in the case of chaplaincy, really does matter. You uh, are doing an, something that's very important for people. We need a policies in ministry. We need charisma. We need confidence. We need, and those were great assets to Paul. You know, Paul has had a good education, new scripture, um, and Paul recognized that. So he knew that even though Apollos wasn't completely right, that uh, he should work with Apollos. It wasn't exactly what Paul wanted, so he didn't rebuke Paulus at all. Instead, he took advantage of the what Paul Apollos had, and he just realized that Paul Apollos just needed some mentorship. He needed Apollos needed the experience and guidance of Priscilla and Aquila to speak God's way more accurately. Paul realized that Apollos just needed some continuing education to get it right. That's why our study of Acts is so important in 2024. We are constantly bombarded by religious information in our society and teaching. And frankly, a lot of disinformation as well. We're being told that the Bible means this and it doesn't and it means that. As if anybody who disagrees with that kind of teaching just hasn't read it or hasn't read it um, correctly. While people will swear that their churches are Bible-believing and Christ-centered often, sadly too often, they misrepresent scripture and they're just engaging in religious tribalism. Bringing church back to an inquisitiveness about scripture Putting away the old patriarchy that, uh, that suppresses the teaching of women. Realizing that charisma is good but, and confidence is good, but you need that has to be hand in hand with expertise and understanding. These are vital. These are very important, I believe, in revitalizing the church. It's not just... Charisma. No, it's mind and heart. It's spirituality and works. It's change and it's questioning. We need Apollos's and we need Priscilla's in the church. This, I believe, is what baptism in the Holy Spirit is really about. And I believe that this is the new beginning that we need as we start 20. 24. Let us pray. Three in one God, God of mind, God of heart, God of body, God of spirit. You are all of these in Father Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the breath of life in the Holy Spirit. Help us to recognize the one true baptism in the Holy Spirit on this baptism of the Lord's Sunday. And give us the confidence of Apollos, but also the guidance of Priscilla to proclaim your way more correctly. We pray for the witness and the ministry of these, your people, to the world in 2024. In the name of Jesus, the Christ. Amen.